Guy Chomsky and Moyers. Paul's one of the best writers we have in the whole movement. Perhaps you've read some of his books about medical marijuana and numerous publications he does for us. I think he's the best writer in the whole country on this subject. I respect him a lot. Uh, lawyers like me uh, can confer with him and counsel with him, and he's an expert witness. He, he goes around the country as an expert witness, so I want to introduce Paul Amartano, Deputy Director of Normal. Whatever happened to him? Thank you, Steve. And I want to thank all of you. I know it's been a long day, and I appreciate you guys for hanging around and staying around with us uh, after our, our typical time constraint. And I, and I want to uh, extend that same appreciation to the panelists here, who, again, are, are staying with us late into the day. And, and, and I think that's going above and sometimes beyond uh, what we ought to expect from people. So I want you in advance to give everyone a hand here. Uh, and thank you. I think this is a really important panel. And one of the reasons I'm moderating it or facilitating it is because it was sort of my idea. Because when we plan these conferences the last two or three years, and we're strategizing what topics we're going to cover. Every year we'd say, okay, let's have a panel on hemp. And as any of you who are sort of regular attendees of our conferences may know, uh, the last couple of years we haven't had a panel on hemp. And that's because as we were making those tough choices about what panels to keep and which ones to drop, hemp wasn't making the cut. And so this year, when we began this discussion, I said, you know, we really ought to talk about hemp. And we ought to talk about why we haven't been talking about hemp. Because that, I think, is an important discussion to have. And the reason is, when I got into this movement in the early 1990s, it was largely because I read a book that you're all familiar with, called The Emperor Wears No Clothes by Jack Herrera. And the thing is, is prior to reading that book, I'd been anti-prohibition, I'd, I'd been angry about our marijuana policy, but I hadn't been pro-pot. I hadn't been excited about marijuana. And the emperor wears no clothes, and this issue of hemp is what got me excited again about cannabis. And I think it got a whole lot of people excited about cannabis during that time. Because the hemp issue is what bridged the gap from the 1980s, where you couldn't get any traction with marijuana, to the mid-1990s, where suddenly we had this renaissance again, this explosion in interest largely triggered by medical marijuana and the passage of medical cannabis in 1996. But the reality is, is when I got excited about marijuana law reform, I got excited about hemp, it was my belief that this was what was going to be the game changer, not medical marijuana. And here we are in 2012, and here we are politically talking about marijuana law reform in a manner that socially, we've really never had the sort of discussions we're having now about legalization, about taxing and revenue, that taxes and revenue that might be gleaned from a legal cannabis market, about the therapeutic potential of medical marijuana. But what's not front and center anymore in this discussion is hemp. So what happened? Where did the enthusiasm go about hemp? And that's why I've assembled this panel of people here that have a unique expertise and that I'm hoping can once again articulate why hemp is relevant, can once again get us as a movement excited about hemp the way in the early 90s people like me were excited about hemp. Quickly to tell you who we've got here on this panel, we have David Bronner, president of Dr. Bronner's Magic Soap. Yeah. yeah. He's on the board of directors of Big Hemp. We have Chris Conrad, author of the book Hemp, Lifeline to the Future, which I also read very shortly after the Emperor of the Book. And also a tremendous book. 
Uh, he's also the uh, founder and director of the Business Alliance for Cannabis Hemp. Uh, Rick Husick is here. He's the uh, associate editor, uh, associate publisher of High Times Magazine. <laughs> and he's involved in, in, in the short-lived Hemp Times Magazine. And we have Patrick Goggin, uh, who is an attorney based in San Francisco. He's the California Legal Counsel uh, for Vote Hemp. And I have a question. Oh, and in front of we have State Assemblyman Christopher Norby, uh, who's the last minute addition, a very important addition to this panel. And he was the co sponsor of the California Industrial Hemp Act, which, Hemp Farming Act, which is somewhat unique in contemporary times, and that California is actually still literally having discussions about hemp. It's actually having many of the discussions that other states were having 15 years ago. They're not having those discussions anymore, and California is, and I'm sure he'll, he'll part, uh, talk to us more about that. But my first question to all of you, and because of time, I hope you know, one or two of you can chime in so we can keep this dialogue moving, uh, is what happened to hemp? Am I, is my impression wrong? Or has something happened to the enthusiasm that we as a movement had in the early 1990s but doesn't seem as apparent today? Has hemp been surpassed by these other issues? And if so, how do we make it relevant once again? Both politically and also from the standpoint of us in this room as a movement. And, and certainly if one or two of you want to chime in, I'm sure we'd all be interested in your thoughts on that. Well, I just jump in and, and, and say that hemp advocacy in, in the United States is alive and kicking and, and well. We've got 17 states that have passed pro-hemp legislation in the past decade or so. In fact, this year, the states of Colorado and New Hampshire have, have passed both pro-hemp legislation. Um, we passed the California legislature over the past five years passed legislation in three separate sessions, most recently last year, only to have Governor Schwarzenegger and then Governor Brown veto it. And I'll let the uh, assembly member at the table who co-sponsored it speak to us uh, to, about that. But just to note, we also have recently introduced uh, to go along with the uh, House Bill 1831, which would leave it to the states, to regulate hemp. We, we just had a Senate bill, a companion bill, uh, introduced this year, and I'll let uh, David Bronner speak to more about that. Chris, do you want to? Yeah, I, I would just say that um, what happened to hemp is that in, in the, in 89, uh, I formed the Business Alliance for Commerce and Hemp, and put a strategy out there of trisecting the subject of cannabis into three specific fields, industrial hemp, medical marijuana, and uh, personal use. Uh, of cannabis and seeing, attacking all three fronts at once and seeing where we got the movement. Now, of those three things, uh, medical marijuana was a little bit known, but not very much. Personal use was kind of uh, something you weren't really supposed to talk about that much. But an industrial hemp had been like totally lost in the shuffle. And uh, as Keith uh, mentioned earlier today, 1990 was a year when there was a huge shift. And, and that had to do with, I think, a couple of things all converging. The first was that uh, I had already got my organization up and chapters around the country going. The second was that I uh, and Jack Herrer put out the 1990 edition of the Emperor's New Clothes, which uh, sent shockwaves across the country and around the world. The third was that uh, a guy named Dana Beal in New York got hold of some of our hemp literature, and at the New York birthday in 1990, they passed out a million copies of a leaflet that on the front said, um, the many uses of hemp, and on the back it said, hidden for the anthropology. And so we mainstreamed straight into the environmental movement. Everybody went to New York City for that year, came back with a piece of paper telling them about hemp was part of their agenda, which they hadn't known before. Uh, and then the other thing was that the Cannabis Action Network uh, was going around the country doing tours, and they didn't have literature, and so we were providing literature for them. And when those all came together, all of a sudden, within a, a year or two, we had people who had never even thought about hemp suddenly being aware of it. And, and, and that included like my grandmother, for example, uh, who was not really pro-marijuana, but when I talked about hemp, she's like, oh, I remember hemp. And so we, we jumped across a generation, and that she didn't even have any idea of the potential of it. So she, even her generation was interested in it. Uh, and it, it went everywhere, it got really excited. We had college campuses, uh, our, uh, groups all over the country that got really excited. And the trajectory for the activism took off very high. 
Uh, meanwhile, on the business side, there's something else was happening. The people who got into the businesses of hemp uh, made some fundamental mistakes. One of them was that we had said that hemp has all these different uses, and so when people got interested in making hemp products, they thought, wow, this is one of everything. And then when they were done, they had one of everything, but they didn't have any money left to market it, and they didn't know which product was the good product. And, and so we had to get this convergence with the businesses how they could approach this issue, as well as the way the activists were approaching the issue. Uh, and then when we fought with the, the activists, uh, there was a, a, another split that kind of happened where we got the Hemp Industries Association formed in 1994, talking about hemp as a different subject than marijuana because we saw it as a non-drug issue, and we're talking about saving the world and creating jobs, not getting high, so it should be treated differently. So the Hemp Industries Association came along and started uh, working out from that point of view. But then another group, the North American Industrial Hemp Council was formed, and they were like anti-marijuana, pro-hemp. Uh, and so what happened though was the activists kind of shot off in one direction, got really worked up, and then all of a sudden medical marijuana came along, and the activists said, hey, that's the future, jumps into medical marijuana, uh, and left the hemp issue hanging. But the business trajectory was quite different. The business trajectory was at first they were skeptical about the information about hemp. It took them a while to find out and understand it. There were challenges to how it worked. There were problems with how to source it. The federal government jumped down their throat a couple of times, like CNS Lumber decided to make hemp, import hemp from China to make building materials. And the feds, they didn't seize their product. They tied it up in customs for six months or, or nine months or whatever it was, uh, so that they could no longer financially keep their product going by the time they got it out there. And, and we had the, uh, the Lakota Indians decide to move forward, and the DEA comes in and violates the foreign treaties and everything with this massive suppression against things. But then at the same time, when the DEA came in and tried to redefine the marijuana laws to include industrial hemp products and food products, particularly the HIA, uh, and I'm looking at some of the board members in here who at the vote down at, at uh, Hawaii, where we decided to go ahead and, and sue the DEA. This is like one of the few times when an activist organization has successfully sued the DEA and won and forced them to change their position. But people, the idea of hemp saving the world was sold in such a hyper hyperbolic manner initially that I don't think it can sustain that level of energy in the activist community because it turns out it takes a long time to save the world and a lot of work with them to do it. It wasn't just, oh, it's an idea and now the world's safe. Uh, but on the industrial side, we've seen a whole different trajectory going on where more and more products, businesses that make products and know how to market those products found how to hemp incorporate hemp into them, uh, whether it be textile products and paper products, primarily in the seed oil industry, which was a sleeper. And that that's where uh, I think we're going to hear a lot from David Bronner. And uh, just to keep this really short, I'm just going to say that a couple of other things that happened was that in Europe, the government over there, the EU, created a subsidy for hemp. And the farmers over there, rather than use that to create hemp, they used it to milk the subsidies. And then the subsidies got pulled. And so the economic value of hemp in Europe was trashed because of the way that the farmers went they saw it as a money crop rather than as an industrial crop. Uh, but meanwhile, Canada and China have totally seen the value of moving forward with cannabis, uh, hemp. And, and so this is where we're seeing the growth going on in these other countries because as long as America won't let the farmers grow it here, it's so difficult to have the uh, economics of fiber crops work out in this country as to be uh, very extremely difficult. And, uh, and then so the future, I think, has to do with the fact that we're really reaching the point of no return planetarily about how we're going to survive. And this whole oil industrial uh, complex industry we've got right now is not sustainable. And I'm a, my great fear is that the way that hemp ends up saving the world is because there's a few people with a few handfuls of seeds left who haven't got poisoned to death by the toxicity of the way that we've created this world right now and that they decide that this is the only way that they can come through. I think that we can prevent that if we can get the enthusiasm back where it belongs. And to that extent, I would say that the gentleman uh, secondarily to me, and I, I recognize the, county, the uh, legislator for his important role, but uh, David Bronner really represents the point where the activist enthusiasm, excitement, and new ways of bringing the information has coincided with the businesses of making it work, making products that you can continue to buy from the farmers and keep it moving forward. And so the issue isn't really what happened to him uh, that it went away anywhere, it's just it shifted from being this explosive, radioactive sort of uh, activist movement sort of thing and something where it's really become into the economy in ways that are less exciting to the activists but profoundly important to the future. And so I think that we're going to see the next wave coming up very soon. Yeah, uh, you know, Augment Chris's remarks, I think you're right on. Um,
you know, I mean, basically the, the hemp markets are, I mean, they're very real and significant, but they're not maybe the overheated hype from back in the day that, you know, the activist base, including myself, got really excited about. But they are, you know, extremely significant. Um, one of the, well, the primary market driver in the United States is seed. So, so hemp seed is uh, unparalleled in its essential fatty acid content and contains an ideal balance of omega-3 and omega-6. Omega-3s are pretty are, uh, s s systematically uh, deficient in the American diet. Doctors recommend uh, fish, fish oil supplements, flax supplements. So hemp is actually better than fish because it doesn't contain the mercury uh, contaminations and other PCBs and environmental toxins. So uh, hemp seed uh, is, at this point, is on pretty much uh, every single store shelf in America. I mean, it's, um, I mean, it's gone from the movement, from this kind of active movement, into this mainstream. And, um, you know, we have Costco. We've got, we've got hemp nut in Costco now. I mean, it's just everywhere. So, you know, and, and every single German automobile uh, on the road right now is made with a, a biocomposite of hemp fiber and polypropylene, which is briefcases. Um, I mean, it's just, I mean, the markets are real and rapidly developing. Um, and from the drug reform standpoint, I mean, which I and I come from, I mean, basically putting hemp seed foods on, the, on, on these shelves and beating DEA and high beat versus DEA, I mean, the first time DEA lost was when DEA tried to ban hemp seed imports. And we won, and when we won, we were able to like, continue this wave of hemp products on the store shelves. So like your mom, you know, and, and grandmothers can, you know, just get down with like, it's like open up cultural space to talk about cannabis, talk about, oh, this is silly, look, you know, it's got all this nutritious seed, it's fiber, it's not just plant foods and health. So, I mean, from the drug reform standpoint, it's been a, you know, very successful trajectory. Um, yeah, it hasn't saved the planet yet, but, um, I mean, there's amazing things happening around the world. The Canadian government is, is, is matching funding for a $50 million build out of Stemergy, which is a, a, a supplier of, of hemp fiber in the automobile industry. The Chinese government, um, we don't advertise the policy. There's a couple of rags we do, West Coast Leaf and uh, Anna Shaughnessy's. We put in, uh, if you've see, if you seen our ad, it has Hun Jintao, the Chinese uh, president or former, I mean, it's in transition, but he's, uh, there's a picture of him visiting a hemp factory in Yunnan. The Chinese government is investing tens of millions of dollars into the hemp industry there. They plan to put 22 million hectares of hemp. The uh, Olympic flooring in the Beijing center was a hemp composite. So there's, there's all kinds of amazing things happening in the hemp front. Um, and I have a bomb to drop that I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait though for. <laughs> <laughs> There is a truism that is echoed through the last several centuries. I'm not even sure who said it. Uh, but you all heard it. War is the health of the state. If you favor a big authoritarian state, then you favor permanent war, whether it's a model, a domestic model, or a foreign model. Now, I don't favor an all-powerful state. I favor a limited government, which protects our freedom and, and provides certain basic services. So, okay. I'd like to tell my, my conservative friends that if you are a real limited government conservative, you can't favor war as a permanent policy domestically or in foreign policy, but unfortunately many of them do. Um, I am a member of the state legislature, represent the 72nd district in North Orange County. I am a Republican, uh, and I come from a fairly Republican district. Um, I did vote in favor uh, of Senate Bill 676, which was sponsored by Leno. I keep calling him Jay, but it's uh, what's his first name? Mark Leno. Uh, Mark Leno from San Francisco. Uh, it did pass the Senate 26 to 13, and also passed the Assembly, which I sit in 47 to 26. Now the parties are, are kind of split on, on this issue. I like to tell my my Democratic friends that they I say, look, I say, where's the Democratic leadership on this? We've got William F. Buckley, we got George Will, we got Ron Paul, we got George Schultz, uh, and we need more Democrats on board, uh, and uh, they they agree. Uh, but Republicans have, of course, their issues as well with this. Now, I voted in favor of the bill. I got three other Republicans. I kind of dragged them kicking and screaming voting for it as well. So there were a total of only four, but there were four Republicans that voted for the legalization of hemp uh, in California. In addition to myself, there was Cameron Smythe uh, from Santa Clarita and LA County, 
and my good friend Bill Berryhill and David Valadeo, who both represent San Joaquin Valley uh, constituencies, who came from counties whose mayor, whose uh, sheriffs had written in support of the bill, saying that they didn't see a law enforcement issue at all. Uh, but during the hearing, among the lobbyists, you had the narcotics officers and, and the other law enforcement unions talking about how bad this bill was and how it was just a cover for a slippery slope toward legalization of all this other stuff. Uh, there were three arguments against it. One was that all these hemp plants will hide the marijuana, the real marijuana, inside. So all the narcotics officers driving down these country roads will see hemp plants and they'll be a cover for the smokable stuff. Of course, that wasn't true because, uh, maybe some of you understand this better than I, but the pollen doesn't mix. And if you try to mix these plants together, you ruin, you ruin both. Uh, the other was, what's this going to look like in a hit piece? I mean, whenever you vote in Sacramento, you think, and this is even more true in Washington, because uh, in Sacramento we've got term limits, so people are always looking to run for the next office. Now, with term limit reform, you're going to have a whole new class of legislators that will be in there for 12 years rather than just for six years in the Assembly or eight in the Senate. And I think this is a positive change. I think a lot of them will be looking more toward long-term change rather than just what's the next office I'm going to run for and what will the hit pieces look like. Now, and so they're thinking, gee, you know, Fred Schmaltz, voter to legalize pot, and you'll have all the, you know, right out of reefer madness. This doesn't sell in a lot of places, and it doesn't sell in my county either. Actually, they got so many hits on me, but they never used them. I ran in a Republican primary against a fellow Republican conservative when I first won this seat, uh, and uh, she criticized my stand on medical marijuana, but I was, I was never hit on it. They never sent literature because they're not sure who, the, who, who do you send this literature to when you hit this stuff? Because you may hit somebody that might respond, but their husband or their wife or their kids may read the literature first and realize this stuff is ridiculous. Uh, and I'm going to vote for this guy, whoever he is. Uh, I was the only mayor in Orange County to come out in favor of Prop 215 in 1996 when I was mayor of Fullerton. And I got a call from the, from the, state, from the state chairman of the Republican Party, a good friend of mine, who said, Darby, you're on the website in favor of the legalization of medical marijuana. I said, yeah, so what? Aren't you for this? Well, sure I'm for it, but they're going to hit you with this in the next election. Well, aren't you? Well, sure I'm for it, but I said, this thing is going to win in my city. How will they hit me for it? Well, I know it, it may win, but they're still going to hit you. Look, this is going to win in Orange County. It's going to win statewide. How are they going to hit me on something that the voters are in favor of? Well, they still will. Of course, they didn't. Because when the thing turns, it, it, it no longer is worth a hit piece. And I, I, I knew, too, this, they wouldn't come out after me against this. Now, having said that, I am in a close race now uh, against an opponent who has the support of all the law enforcement unions, and I think they're coming after me on this issue. They can't say it because it's not really that popular an issue to hit somebody with it, uh, despite the political reluctance to support it. Uh, but it did pass a 47 to 26 in the Assembly, and it went on to the governor. And the governor used the third argument against it, not the hit piece argument, not that it's going to hide marijuana plants, but he said, look, right or wrong, this, this stuff is still banned under federal law, and even though the law is absurd, I'm not going to put California farmers in jeopardy for being arrested, so Governor Brown did veto uh, the bill. Um, and he vetoed it for a reason which was legally logical, but at the same time, politically, if states start to go in this direction, even Paul Ryan himself, I think, was quoted yesterday in Colorado saying, look, this is a state's rights issue. It shouldn't be a federal issue. I hope he says that if he's vice president from all the influence he may have. Um, and I'm sure you'll get Joe Biden to say something like that. I mean, Joe says everything else. And maybe he'll come out without the vice presidential debate because it certainly wasn't addressed last night in the presidential debate. Anyway, it was vetoed. I'm sure it will come back. When it does, I'll support it. And I think the governor may have a different view on this as well. Uh, so support those people that support it. Make it a political issue. It's not just a fringe issue. There's an entire law enforcement industrial complex that has to do with prisons. It has to do with those that, that are employed in law enforcement agencies. It has to do with those that sell technology. It has to do with those that, do with that sell drones that are now uh, can legally uh, unmanned aircraft that can crisscross our state. Uh, it has to do with lives that are lost in the criminal justice system. People who wind up committing felonies, sometimes even a third strike, who've hurt no one, but they've gotten involved in possessing certain amounts of marijuana or certain amounts of drugs. They go to jail for that, they wind up on probation, they violate probation because they didn't 
make a phone call at a certain time, they go back again, and because they maybe gave it to a friend who then felt that they had to report them because the friend was arrested and the only way they could get out of mandatory prison term was to become a informant for the police department uh, or, the, or the sheriff's department. There was a great article in New York, in the New Yorker, didn't you read this just last month, about a whole generation of kids in college who were being arrested and they're saying, you're going to go to prison unless you turn informant. And then they turn informant, and they never let them go. And they have to inform on friend. All this stuff is involved with this. It's very, very, very expensive. It destroys lives. And it's, I think, something that people, regardless of their political labor, are more and more willing to look at. I'm willing to look at it. And I think more and more people in the state have. So whatever you're doing, whether it's hemp, whether it's other uses of this, uh, you've got to continue. Uh, because you have to remember three things about the truth. First, it's ridiculed, then it's savagely attacked, and then it's accepted as conventional wisdom. Uh, I'm not sure at what point we're at this, but I've got so many people, uh, not just younger, and I'm not young, I'm 62, not just younger, my gener older generation as well. Look at George Schultz, former Secretary of State, he's got to be pushing in his mid-90s, who will say, under their breath, in order to be right, this stuff ought to be regulated, legalized and taxed, but if I say that, I'll be killed politically. No, you won't, because I've been saying this. I haven't been touched. Because, because a human in part of life is not just to reflect what you think your constituents want on the surface, but tell them what they think they should want. It's an exchange. It's not just pull them and do what they tell you. It's also tell them the alternatives and to educate them. I was a high school classroom teacher for 25 years. I've got a son who just graduated at USC, who is a, a head of one of the, he was involved in the, uh, what is it, the Students for a Sensible Drug Policy. It's about freedom, it's about morality, and it's about treating adults in a mature way so they can make adult decisions about their own lives. And if you phrase it like that, say a couple of things. I'm going to be a little bit of a contrarian here, perhaps. Um, I just listened to the four gentlemen here, and pretty much they brought me up to date about what's happening in him. Uh, everything here you're talking about, that it's alive and well, and, and I, everything you're doing is phenomenally, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a wonderful thing and, and something that should be continued. But until you just informed me that him is still alive and well, I wasn't aware of that. And when I was asked to be on this panel, it's kind of like, what am I doing on this panel? What's happened to him? The first thing wasn't to me thinking, well, you know, it's not here anymore, it's dead. What happened to him? What I thought was why that question means how come him didn't become a major industry? Back in the 90s when I first got involved in this, and I came the same way you did. I came in through reading The Emperor, and I came in through starting hemp initiatives in Jersey and things like that, and never went anywhere, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> but, the, the point is, at that point, we thought that hemp was going to become a major industry with like Calvin Klein, and we thought, oh, you know, Drew Armani and all this stuff. A lot of it back then, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of it was about fiber back then. The first thing that came along was all about clothes, and you could buy all these clothes. But the actual clothes were very expensive because they were imported. You had to import every single fiber that you had here. And that puts you at odds with trying to compete with domestic products such as synthetics and cotton. At least that's how it appeared to me as a business model. I thought the business model was great. Now, I'm happy to hear what you're telling me. What I hear here is that most of the hemp that is now in there is in the form of food and is in the form of, of products. And actually, the fiber thing is gone because the price point never went down to the comfort point. And that's the first thing that I Notice, I, I'm answering the question why I think it didn't become a major industry. The second reason I think it didn't become a major industry, and I'm sure a lot will disagree with me here, but what happened to hemp? The second part of that question is what happened in, in my heart? Why don't I care as much about hemp anymore? I used to care an enormous amount. It brought me to this, it brought me to my job. And I don't really care that much about it. I'm not that enthused about it anymore. I, don't, I certainly don't look up hemp on Google and find out what's going on. Or I would have in the 1990s. Well, why was that? 
Well, as I got involved into it, and I got involved, and I read Jack's book, and I knew how Jack felt about marijuana as well as him, that really excited me. And then I started getting involved because I was a big fan of marijuana. And so I felt that um, marijuana and hemp were together. And then as we, I thought the, the fight would be the same fight. And then when I got into it, I found a lot of, of hamsters, not the ones on this panel. I, and I'm not being <laughs> out, I'm not going to smoke a grass. It's not the ones on this panel. But a lot of hamsters wanted to shy away from marijuana. It's not, uh, it's not dope, it's rope. Well, and soap. And soap. And, and you know, you can say that. You can say that, and it's all true to a certain extent. But here's the other truth, is that hemp has the same enemies as marijuana. And you can sit there and say, no, this is something different. But eventually, you're going to come up against a, a ceiling where you can only go so far before your enemies kick in and say, no, 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 we're not going to allow that to happen. And I think that's what happened to hemp. And I'm going to finish really quickly with what I really feel here. I think the medical marijuana industry should pay attention to what happened to the hemp industry. They are divorcing themselves from recreational cannabis, enhancing cannabis. And I think that they are making, that they too are going to have a limited amount of place before the enemies kick in and say, wait a minute, we're not going to allow this to happen. I'm not saying that if, if the hemp industry embraced marijuana entirely, that it would be a major industry, but I think it would have happened differently. I think my heart would still be in hemp if that didn't happen. Because I tell you something, the very first time somebody I respected said to me, it's, it's not dope, it's rope, I started feeling cool towards this entire industry. And that's what happened to me. And that's what happened to me. You know, move this discussion a little bit further. Uh, Patrick, in particular, you mentioned the fact that we had these 17 states where some <coughs> legislation has been enacted regarding hemp. And I know in some of these states, like North Dakota and Montana, the legislation itself actually allows for hemp cultivation. And my understanding is the reason that there is still, of course, no actual hemp cultivation in those states, despite the passage of these laws, is because the assemblyman mentioned, we run up against this argument that, well, it is still federally illegal. Now, we also have 17 states that allow for the use of medical marijuana, which, of course, is equally federally illegal. Yet, we have pragmatic models, like in Colorado, and in Maine, and New Mexico, and in a number of other states coming very quickly to fruition, like New Jersey and Connecticut and Vermont, where these states are moving forward, they are putting their acceptance to the notion of licensing the production and distribution of hemp, regardless of the fact that the federal government says you can't do it. So my question is, why have we not seen a similar showdown under the same principles that this is a state versus federal issue, and why haven't some of these states pushed the envelope with the federal government in the same manner that we've seen a handful now, but a growing number of medical marijuana states basically welcome this battle? Well, we actually have. We, we saw a, a battle ultimately occur in the courts uh, in North Dakota, where originally a uh, DEA license was, going, was required, but the when, when the DEA delayed uh, implementation of that or issu issuing licenses or permits, the, the legislature unanimously passed an amendment removing that barrier. But they, the, the, the approach was to go to court to make sure that we wouldn't put, we didn't want to put farmers in jeopardy. And so we, we went into court, we sought declaratory relief, a, a ruling from the court that would allow us to engage in our and assert our state rights to grow industrial hemp. And in that circuit, I believe it was the, the Eighth Circuit, which is similar to prior precedent. Regardless of the structure of the bill, the courts in, I believe, the First Circuit initially, and then the Eighth Circuit said, this is a congressional issue. 
you got to go to Congress to change the law. The way marijuana is defined under federal law is it includes industrial hemp or it doesn't distinguish between industrial hemp except for by allowing us to possess sterilized seed and fiber. We were, we were primed for the showdown in California. Had, had either Governor Schwarzenegger or Governor Brown just signed the bill, we would have had our day in court. And the, the statement by Governor Brown that this was an absurd policy and yet I'm not going to put our farmers in jeopardy was in fact an absurd statement. We went to the governor and said, we will, the way the bill was structured, we needed to have seed from within the state and there was no way the farmers were going to go just get you know, unsterilized hemp seed. And, and we would have told, we would have stood in front of farmers planning and said, we're, we're going to go into court, we're going to seek a preliminary injunction, we're going to get a court to order and rule and allow us, our farmers, to grow before we would put them in jeopardy. Unfortunately, that day never came. Yeah, so I mean, just Patrick said, and, and I think just the, but the fundamental difference between industrial hemp and medical marijuana is, I mean, you have the same basic state permission to grow industrial hemp and medical marijuana in a federal prohibition. The difference is that with medical, you have a relatively small number of plants. You have life and death, or at least like, a, you know, a huge increase in personal well-being at stake. And so there's a huge motivation to break the law for a few number of plants. And it's just, it's not a big deal. Whereas with industrial hemp, you have, sure, farmers want a profitable rotation crop, but, you know, to throw over, to grow over a million plants on 10 acres, right? I mean, under federal law, I mean, this is multiple life sentencing. This is yes, totally different. You're not going to have civil disobedience with farmers growing acres and acres of hemp, which is what you need to do to make it commercially viable. You know, there's no point in growing 12 plants, of, you know, 12 industrial hemp plants, or 99 industrial hemp plants. You know, that, that would make like two bottles or so. You know, I mean, it's, it's so, that's fundamentally, that's the number one reason why it's the difference. You just, you don't have civil disobedience with farmers growing hemp because it's just, they don't have that much motivation to do it. I mean, yeah, they want money, but. Um, Are there hemp bills in Congress and what is the status so, of them? So, yeah, so then, so then just to, um, well, quickly, just what Patrick was saying, our, our, our judicial strategy was really sound. I mean, it just sucked, we had to go up through the Eighth Circuit. We had, North Dakota had a perfect hemp bill. Um, it was, you know, it was all in-state seed that would be planted. It was basically the Rage precedent. Rage basically said that because medicine is fungible with the illicit market for, for drug marijuana, there'll be inevitable diversion and swelling of the interstate market for drug marijuana. So we, you know, we had a perfect case. We're like, okay, well, we're, we're defining cannabis to be non-drug. Uh, you know, no flowers when we leave the farm. Only, only uh, you know, fiber and sterilized seed, which are unregulated, are being placed in interstate commerce. Uh, you know, if there is any diversion of the flowers, it's not fungible with the interstate market drug marijuana, or you know, it is in a way with oregano. Is. I mean, there's just no, there's no substitution, and it was a, a beautiful strategy. But we just had a retarded, you know, Eighth Circuit judges, and we just, you know, we really wish we could have sent this through the Ninth Circuit, but we just kept getting vetoed by Schwarzenegger. And you know we couldn't we, we couldn't launch that strategy. You know it's unfortunate. Um, so you know so what we've lacked really is a federal champion. I mean this is a you know so here's the differences you know basically between medical and industrial. So you know we need we need to change federal law. I mean we're not going to get it doesn't matter how many more states we get. People are not going to break federal law and grow industrial hemp. And so here's the bomb. So yes, uh, two days ago, uh, Rand Paul's chief of staff called me up. Um, we, so Rand Paul is introduced with Senator Wyden from Oregon, a bill into the Senate in August. Um, and you know, I always thought Wyden was the guy kind of heading this. He's a Democrat, great. But Rand Paul is all about it. And if you like Google Rand Paul and Hemp, you can just see what I mean. The guy is like making this his issue. Um, I mean, he's the rock star right now and on the Republican side in, in the Senate. Um, they're reforming the Kentucky Land Commission after 10 years. Um, you know, we're, we're putting up matching, putting up 50 grand, they're going to raise it from their base you know, and promote, you know, for honors to 500,000 plus libertarian people. And I mean, basically, he's going to make this happen. I mean, he's just, I don't care if it's wrong, I don't care if it's wrong. You know, I'm, you know, we're going to push the Senate because I'm talking, it was like, all you need to do is have the executive branch 
make the DOJ just say industrial hemp or pursuant state law is, is fine. You don't need to actually change federal law. You just have a policy change within the executive branch. Uh, which, you know, that's where Obama has been so incredibly disappointing. You know, as an Illinois state senator, he voted twice for industrial hemp farming. And it's just been a complete disappointment, you know, as he has been on, on medical and everything else. Um, what kind of blowback do you think will come? Like when you say, okay, we're going to separate this, we want to make just so you can make industrial hemp. You know, well, do you think at that point the DA is going to go and say, no, 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 it's a starting course for legalization? Oh, of course, that. of course, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, 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 it's the same thing. And, and just, you know, strategically, you know, as far as, like, why industrial hemp, like, you know, we put on and play a street and don't, like, say, hey, we're with medical and we're with recreational. And right. It's all one wonderful plan and all these that, That's extremely valuable to do that. And, like, and extremely valuable. But I, I think strategically that at the end of the game, until you legalize marijuana, everything is a red-headed stepchild. Oh, and because the, they're going to come after They're going to come after And they're going to have more power than you can. And factionalization is the worst thing that ever happened in marijuana law reform. And as we sit here and bicker with each other about whether or not it's hemp, or it's medicine, or it's a recreational object, they are enemies sit back and applaud. Don't worry, they're going to kill themselves in this issue. Right, I'd love to address it is, so, so, so basically that you have, I mean, like Gronish, for instance, like we give ASA 100 grand a year, you know, we give, you know, MAPS a lot of money, I'm going to be on the board, you know, I'm all about, you know, legalization, yeah. I mean, psychedelics and marijuana are key to the survival of the species, right? Okay, but I am all in favor of the industrial hemp only, I mean, when you have a hemp, like a bunch of activists making crappy products was, was not the way to, to do it, I mean, we have to have, you know, the, the hemp has a coalition of conservative farmers who want nothing to do with yeah. You know, I mean, we have, like, you know, businessmen, like, so as far as, like, let's just say the, the hemp fiber problem with, with clothing and why it's so expensive. Well, the big breakthrough we need is cottonization of hemp fiber so it can run on the cotton gene infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So that's been really what's holding up hemp. But there's been all these breakthroughs that are happening right now. Naturally advanced technologies out of Oregon is uh, working with Hain underwear. Right. Um, unfortunately, they're kind of switching to flax just because of the prohibition. But the, but this technology, as it happens, will. I mean, hemp is going to be a big deal. But but we need to play it straight. That's a word. Like as I, we I, put on the hemp. Hat, strategically, yeah. I think you have to play it straight. But I also that, like if everybody, if all the hemp companies had your the way that you, Dr. Bronner approaches this, I would be very happy because you don't deny. I read your I, this morning. Getting ready for this, I read your read, uh, website this morning. You don't deny the presence of marijuana psychic. The second one was the uh, the uh, Dr. Cousin of, of hemp. You're not denying a lot of people back in that I remember in the, in the 90s, and but they were viciously against being involved in marijuana law reform, and I think that was a strategic mistake. Absolutely. Okay. Well, here's so to get, uh, some you know kind of in, inside drama, baseball. So NAIC, which Chris was talking about, North right. Industrial Hemp Council was formed basically just like that. It was a bunch of conservative, like, ad bureaucrats and industry. And if had, I recall, is that uh, James Wilson? James Wilson was a lobbyist. From, from the CIA. CIA. So, so and, they were, and they had the strategy, okay, let's kick out all the hippies, everyone with any remote tie to, to yeah. marijuana or medical, uh, we're kicking them out. And, and they, allowed, they kicked out all the best people. And, um, and then the DA attacked us, right? right? And then so we go, I was like, okay, well, you know, we gotta fight, fight the DA. And uh, you know, and they're all you know, Woolsey. They're all like, uh, you know, f you know, we're serving hemp foods, and you know, they're just completely lame. You that know, organization. Gotta get closer to the mic. Yeah. Speak yeah. to the side. I can't hear a damn. All right. Answer. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so the, to to back up Rick's point, there was back in the day, the North American Industrial Hemp Council was formed expressly to basically kick out all hippies out of hemp, and we're gonna make cut a deal with the DEA and grow a hemp fire. And that strategy was stupid, it didn't work, DA attacked us anyway, and then the NAIC ended up folding up shop and disappeared. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, but, I mean, but nonetheless, I mean, like, the, the markets for hemp are growing, and you have to be, you know, you gotta talk about, like, omega-3 for health, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, fiber for, I mean, you gotta talk about it, you can't be like, oh, and marijuana's great because it's awesome, you know, it's like, you know, you're, 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 it's interfering with the market. You gotta, like, focus on your marketing message. I, I, I want to jump in on that, Terry. I think you got to play it straight, but I also think that you, um, in, in playing it straight, you should, it should not be, in, you shouldn't be in a position of denying what it is. Sure. And that's, that's yeah. what I think has happened. In the past, I said, no, it's not dope, it's rope. In fact, it is dope. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a bad word for it, but in fact, it is dope. And that's my, my whole point, is that I think that 
denying it. It's not that I'm asking uh, hemp companies to advocate for legalization. Mm -hmm. Advocate, this is the position of this company. I'm asking them to not distance themselves from legalization entirely because I think I think it's a misstep because ultimately the people against legalization will step up and say, you're going to save people's money. Well, I mean, just to, to say, like, what was very helpful, for instance, Nature's Path, Renault, I don't know, mm -hmm. you know, it's like the leading independent, you know, natural serial killer. So Aaron Stevens, like, found his guru and was spitting out of control with, with drugs and he's totally anti-drug. He's, okay, so Aaron Stevens is totally anti-drug guy. Um, but he loves hemp and he thinks it's very healthy and, and he has some of the market leading uh, hemp products. And he basically anchored the market when DEA attacked us, and we're you know we're talking to Whole Foods, one of those, they're all like, man, we got to fucking schedule, schedule one drugs on the shelf, we got to get rid of it. And having Aaron Stevens to be able to you know just to, to say, hey, don't worry about it. this, is nothing to do with marijuana, just we're gonna win, this is stupid. You know, having him being there, and just you know, from basically being anti-marijuana, pro hemp guy, was hugely helpful. Uh, and, you, know, you should have words like that. There yeah. should be a position in which you play it straight. We're not talking about marijuana. We never will. But I, I saw too many people sit there and try to distance themselves. And that really, really, I think not only was it turning me off personally, but I think it's a business mistake. It sounds like Seinfeld when, uh, remember George and Jerry, well, we're not gay, we're not boyfriends, not that there's anything wrong with it, but <laughs> we aren't happen to be that. So. Lots of the medical guys are doing right now. Not that you're saying, you're wrong. This is a Seinfeld disclaimer. I do want to jump in here because I know they're about, we are about out of time. I do want to pose one final question to each of the panel. I'll give you 60 seconds if you can answer it, uh, or keep trying to hold your remarks to about 60, 60 seconds. And this goes back to Jack Herrera and this notion hemp can save the planet. You know, we heard 25,000 products can be made out of hemp. This is environmentally friendly, this is economically sustainable. I know about the hurdles that exist in America. But is there any place right now on this planet that you believe has fully embraced the potential of hemp? If so, where, where is it? And if not, why? why? Why are we still waiting for this plant to reach its full potential? Uh, so China is uh, unfortunately leading the way. I mean, they're, 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 the Chinese <laughs> government is investing hugely into their hemp industry. Um, if you Google China hemp, it'll bring up this this page, and you'll see you know Lin Jin Tao visiting this, this huge factory in Yunnan. They they aim to like basically use that as a rural uh, like, like solving rural poverty and uh, you know everything Jack dreamed of is the Chinese government is it, it's getting out. Um, yeah, and and there are I mean there has there are some real breakthrough uh, you know, R and D challenges that are you know. As they get solved, they're really going to open it up. I mean, basically, again, communization of hemp fiber to make it, you know, as economic as cotton will be huge. Um, you know, the Canadian, like the, the fiber processing technology. I mean, there is a, the overall trend is looking for natural fiber alternatives to synthetic fibers. I mean, it, you know, the, the, the sad history of hemp is going to reverse. You know, as this overall trend continues, hemp, you know, it's not going to be the one fiber. I mean, it's going to be hemp, it's going to be flax, it's going to be a bunch of fiber. But all these fiber crops are going to grow in importance, and especially hemp because it doesn't need to compete with food crops. Because it is a food crop, it is so when it generates its waste straw, I mean, there's a lot of huge potential in hemp. But yeah, it's not happening as fast as everyone thought, but it will happen. I'm going to cut it off there because I know we're short of time, and there's a social party going to take place in the next few minutes. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. <laughs>